Welcome to our third and final lecture on Aristotle's ethics. Today we're going to get into the details of his account of moral virtue and the life of contemplation. We concluded last time talking, ab talking about moral virtue as consisting of the successful application of practical reason to activity, to action. Right, the morally virtuous person is the person who can identify the right thing to do and chooses the right to, to do the right thing. Right? So, so, so moral virtue involves excellence both of um, the rational soul and the non-rational soul specifically involves excellence of practical reasoning and excellence in volition taken in combination. Right? Excellence in volition by itself is simply to, to choose strongly, let's say. Right? The, the, a, a volition is blind. It's simply an impetus towards an object. Um, uh, so excellence in volition in and of itself is not a human virtue, is not a human good. But excellence in volition under the guidance of uh, practical reason uh, is a distinctively uh, human form of excellence. It is the excellence that we call moral virtue. And I'll alternatively refer to moral and civic virtue, or, or just moral virtue itself. These speak to the virtues of character as they, are, as they arise within our um, interpersonal engagements and in our larger civic life. Now, we've said that moral virtue arises as the result of the intersection of practical reason and volition uh, activity. Um, and this would suggest that moral virtue is, in some sense, rational. Right? Inasmuch as it is a, 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 a faculty of reason that identifies the virtuous thing to do, that would seem to suggest that virtue, in some sense, um, is rational. And the question is, in what sense? Right? What is rational about moral virtue? And here it's useful to remember that the word rational has a number of different senses, right? There are, different, there are many different uses of the word rational. It means different things depending upon the context. Um, one such use of the word rational, I would maintain, is, uh, the, the, in the, is the following. The rational person is conceived of as prudent and as moderate. Right? And if you just think about this, think about it the opposite. Right? We often describe extremes, extremes either of excess uh, or extremes of deficiency, as irrational or crazy. Right? Someone who engages in wild extreme behavior we will often describe as crazy. And similarly, um, a, a, a person who, who, who exhibits moderateness of temperament, evenness of, of, of temperament, and moderateness of behavior, um, we, 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 we commonly describe as rational. So this notion of prudence and moderation is one sense that we attach to the word rational. And Aristotle says that this is precisely the sense in which the moral virtues are rational and the vices are irrational. Right? So on Aristotle's view, the morally virtuous person um, is always the person of moderate temperament. Right? The moral virtues, all these, these the, the virtues that you can think of, the virtue of temperance, the virtue of courage, the virtue of honesty, um, and, and others that, that Aristotle will list uh, as examples, all of these virtues, Aristotle will argue, represent moderate states of character. They are moderate, they, they, they stem from the moderate temperament. The right thing to do, right, the right choice in any given circumstance, always will be the moderate choice. And the wrong choices will always take, take one the form of one extreme or another. The wrong choice will either be an extreme of excess, meaning that, what, that, that it will represent doing too much of something, or the wrong choice will involve an um, extreme of deficiency, doing too little of something. There's, there's a fascinating sense here in which Aristotle th is, is, Aristotle's account of moral virtue encompasses what today we would also include under the umbrella of mental health. Aristotle makes this very interesting analogy at one point in the Nicomachean Ethics. He says that um, moderation is, is good for your mind, uh, is, good for, is good for the state of your character in the same way that it's good for the health of your body. If you look at page 25 of your, of your, of your, of your reading of, of your Aristotle, you'll notice the, the, the following passage in the middle. He says, quote, states, he, he says, let us consider this, the fact that states like this are naturally corrupted by deficiency and excess, as we see in the cases of strength and health. 
For both too much exercise and too little ruin one, one's health, and likewise too much food and drink and too little ruin one's health, while the right amount produces, increases, and preserves it. Okay? So he says, look, it's a truth about the human body that extremes of excess and deficiency are bad for, its, for our health, and moderation is good for it. Right? So if you work out too little, obviously it's bad for you, physically. But if you work out too much, it's also bad for you. Uh, I, I, I recall a, a professor I had in graduate school who um, had been a professional power lifter. Now the man was 65 years old. He was so obese uh, that he could not stand up from a chair, from a seated position, without great effort. I mean, he would stand up, and that, that mo alone, standing up, would cause like sweat to pour down his face and cause him to breathe heavily. Now, of course, the reason was because he had lifted too many weights. He had become too big and it was something that his body could not sustain into his older age and it all turned into fat. And Aristotle's point is neither excessive, neither, uh, ni neither excessive or deficient act, uh, exercise is good for you. Moderate exercise is good for you. Same thing with eating. If you eat too little and starve yourself, it's bad for you. Of course, if you eat too much and become uh, morbidly obese, it's also bad for you. What's good for you is to eat a moderate amount. So moderation is the general principle of physical health. Right? Similarly, Aristotle wants to say, moderation in temperament, moderation of character, represents a kind of spiritual health, the health of one's character. So the moral see, see we tend to separate, right? we tend to separate questions of one's moral fitness, one's moral virtue, and questions of one's mental health. For us, mental health is a sort of a medical issue, and uh, moral soundness is within the purview of religion or ethics or wherever one derives one's moral codes from. But Aristotle, for Aristotle, this, this sort of separation is artificial. For Aristotle, the, st the, 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 the morally virtuous uh, state is the state of of, of mental health, right? To be temperate or to be courageous or to be honest represent not only uh, moral uh, virtues but also represent a healthy character, a healthy temperament. So for Aristotle, moral virtue is rational in the sense that moral virtue always uh, springs from moderate forms of character, moderate, moderateness of temperament, and always is manifested in moderate action. Choices which always reflect the mean in between extremes of excess and deficiency. That's why he goes on right after he says the business about, about exercise and, and food and drink. He then goes on to say, the same goes for temperance, courage, and the other virtues. The person who avoids and fears everything, never standing his ground, becomes cowardly, while he who fears nothing but confronts every danger becomes rash. In the same way, the person who enjoys every pleasure and never restrains himself becomes intemperate, while he who avoids all pleasures as boars do becomes, as it were, insensible. Temperance and courage, then, are ruined by excess and deficiency and preserved by the mean. So the direct analogy between the conditions that are favorable to physical health and the conditions that are favorable to the health of one's character. Right? Moral virtue ref represents the health of one's character. Right? The morally virtuous person is, 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 the, is, the, is the healthy person from a character perspective. And um, uh, physical health, uh, of course, uh, is what we look for in the case of our, our bodies and uh, is also uh, engendered by... Uh, moderation in all things. Now Aristotle illustrates this idea, and, and this, in, the, in the literature, this, this, this theory that, the, that moral virtue always represents the mean between extremes of excess and deficiency. Um, Aristotle, th this, this, this theory has come known to be, be called the doctrine of the golden mean, right, mean meaning an in-between point, um, <coughs> and golden, I guess the idea is that uh, moral virtue, which is golden, is always represents a moderate, uh, s the moderate position in between extremes of excess and deficiency. Aristotle helpfully illustrates this principle through a number of examples. Um, I'm going to talk about three, temperance, courage, and honesty. And the idea is to take these, th right, th here's, here's one way of confirming the truth of a moral theory like Aristotle, of, of, of an ethics like Aristotle's, right? take a number of commonly accepted virtues, right? So things that everyone will accept are moral virtues, 
and then see if they can be fruitfully and successfully analyzed underneath the Aristotelian theory. In other words, if the theory of the mean that Aristotle is proposing gives an adequate treatment of these three virtues, we will at least have good reason to think that the theory is true. So if we can show that temperance, courage, and honesty, three virtues which I think everybody would agree on, upon are, that they are moral virtues, if we can show that in each case these represent moderate states of character and moderate choices of action, that we will have gone a long way towards confirming the truth of Aristotle's theory. Okay. So let's go through each one. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to chart each one on a spectrum. Okay. So imagine a, a, a line segment, the, each pole of which re reflects an extreme. So let's say that one pole ex reflects the extreme of excess, the other pole reflects the extreme of deficiency. The midpoint of the line segment um, re represents the mean. If Aristotle is correct in his analysis of moral virtue, then we should always be able to plot the moral virtue on these, 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 these little charts. The moral virtue should always fall at the midpoint, and at each pole we should have corresponding moral vices. Okay. So let's take the easiest example uh, is courage. So let's do courage first. Okay. Now, when we, when we describe someone as courageous, what we're, what we're speaking about is about their willingness to take risks. Right? Right? The virtue of courage speaks to a person's willingness to take risks. Now, one can have too much of this. Right? There is such a person, there, there's such a thing as a person who takes too many risks, who risks when nothing uh, important is at stake. We don't ascribe to such a person the virtue of courage, rather we ascribe to such a person the vice of rashness. So rashness represents um, an excess of the quality uh, that underlies courage. Of course, there are also people who have too little of this quality. There are people who are uh, too unwilling to take risks. Right? People who even when something enormously important is at stake, are not willing to risk one little hair on their head. And of course, we don't ascribe the virtue of courage to these kinds of people either. Rather, we describe them as uh, having the vice of cowardice. This is a vice of deficiency. It, it, it reflects an a, uh, insufficient amount of the, of the relevant quality. The courageous person, Aristotle says, uh, sits in between these two extremes. The courageous person is the person who's willing to take risks in proportion to the, the, import of, of, of the importance of, 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 what's, of what one is taking a risk for. Right. Right, so the courageous person is a, is a moderate risk taker, an appropriate risk taker. So at least with the case of courage, it would seem that the Aristotelian analysis is successful. Courage does represent a moderate state of character, moderate behavior choices, and indeed, the extremes of excess and deficiency do represent the corresponding vices, right, corresponding to the virtue of, of courage, the corresponding vices of rashness on the one hand and cowardice on the other. Let's do the same thing with temperance. Temperance speaks to uh, our capacity and willingness to um, control ourselves in the pursuit of pleasures, typically sensory pleasures, uh, food, drink, sex. Okay. So temperance speaks to that, that, that capacity and willingness to exercise self-control in the pursuit of pleasure. Now, Of course, the most familiar corresponding vice is the vice of deficiency. That is, there are many people who have insufficient self-control. Right? These are people who simply pursue pleasure uh, to the ends of the earth, no matter what harm it causes them. Um, 
And the, 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 the word that, that comes to mind to describe this vice of deficiency, because again, it's a deficiency in the relevant quality. It's a lack of sufficient self-control. Um, there isn't one word to cover all the varieties of insufficient uh, self-control, but the word that's used in, with respect to food, of course, is gluttony. Right, so the vice of gluttony is precisely a def the deficiency of the relevant quality, a deficiency of self-control with respect to food. But now, of course, there's also a vice of excess. One can be excessively self-controlling. Right? The sort of person who never indulges in any pleasure. Right? Um, there, the, you know, the... the the proverbial church lady type, right? Who, you know, even at their daughter's wedding won't take a drink, well, because we don't drink, that sort of thing. And Aristotle, in my view, quite correctly says, well, this is not a virtue either. This is not temperance. Um, he refers to this vice of excessive self-control as insensibility, right? This is a person who is insensible, a person who is incapable of, of enjoying sensation, um, the word that probably we are most familiar with reflecting this kind of excess, excessive self-control with respect to sex uh, is prudishness. And prudishness is not a virtue, it's a vice. It's a vice of excess, excessive, um, excessive uh, self-control. I think that this example of temperance raises an interesting point. Of course, if you know your American history, you know that there was a movement called the Temperance Movement. And, of course, the temperance movement involved complete and total abstention from alcohol, from any drinking at all. So we're not just talking about drinking, you know, 24, you know a 24 pack of beer. A, temp a person in the temperance movement thinks you shouldn't even have wine with, with a meal. Shouldn't have a glass of champagne uh, to celebrate someone's nuptials. And, th listen, there may be any m number of reasons for this. You know, certainly maybe somebody's a raging alcoholic and really, really ought not drink anything. But we're talking in general. Is temperance a virtue? And Aristotle would say that if by temperance what you mean is complete abstention, it is not a virtue. It reflects a defect, a deformity of character, an extreme of character. And I think that this speaks to a certain, a, a very important difference between the way Aristotle thinks about moral virtue and the way that moral virtue, uh, that we tend to think about it, and specifically those of us, uh, the people, those of us who come out of um, a Judeo, the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, there are any number of absolute prohibitions and absolute requirements. And these, of course, are extreme, right? To, to completely prohibit something or to completely require something is a form of excess or deficiency, right? It's for Aristotle always would be too much or too little. And I think that we often think today of moral virtue as either complete, you know, total and complete abstinence, refraining from something, or complete and total commitment to doing something. So on the one hand, you have the sort of the, the prudy, teetotally sorts of people who sort of walk up buttoned up to their throats right, and never enjoy themselves, never do anything. They're just completely, you know, excessive in their self-control uh, and in their refusal to in, ever indulge. And then, of course, you have, you know, uh, uh, you know, people who are sort of incessantly charitable and always do-gooding and always... Um, 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 spreading the word, so to speak, uh, and, and this also reflects extremes. Now, I'm not necessarily just saying that this is incorrect. What I'm trying to do is point out how, how, how distant this is from Aristotle's view. To the extent to which today we tend to think of morality in terms of absolute prohibitions and absolute requirements, we are completely a far afield, we are totally afield from Aristotle's conception of morality. For Aristotle's conception of morality, morality always reflects moderation. Right? That, 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 that middle road. Right? Right? Never too much, but also never too little. Right? The, virtual, the virtuous person enjoys, but enjoys in a limited fashion. The virtuous person puts themselves out, or is obligated, but not till the ends of the earth. 
Um, another example of this, I think a very good example, the last one I'll discuss is honesty. I think today that if you ask somebody today what, what, what is meant by the virtue of honesty, they would say someone who always tells the truth. But for Aristotle, this of course is a, ver is, 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 is a vice of excess. There can be such thing as excessive truth telling. We have names for the excessive truth, truth teller. We might refer to him or her as a tattler or as someone with a loose tongue. Right? Surely we're not always required to tell the truth. Surely sometimes the moral thing to do is to lie. Right? If I'm sitting in my house and the doorbell rings and it's, you know, the axe murderer of the month and the axe murderer of the month says to me, well, um, I'm trying to find this person so I can go chop off their head. Uh, do you happen to know where they are? Suppose you know where they are. You certainly are not required to tell the axe murderer where the person is. Right. If you want to make this less fanciful of an example, during the Second World War, of course, there were many conscientious Gentiles who uh, hid Jews from the Germans. The Germans were rounding, of course, round, rounding up millions of Jews and uh, sending them to the gas chambers. And there were any number of conscientious uh, Gentile uh, neighbors, friends, etc., townsfolk who uh, thought this was monstrous and would hide Jews in their basements and in their attics and so on and so forth. Now, certainly the moral virtue of honesty does not require such a person to tell the Germans where, the, where, where, where they're hiding the Jews if the Germans asked. And so honesty is one of those examples where I think that we tend to think of it as, as a virtue constituted by extreme, right? You know, only tell the truth. But I also say that's not a virtue, to only tell the truth. To tell the truth when the truth is not appropriate, to tell the truth when really what's required is a lie, is not a virtue but a vice. For Aristotle, honesty is again going to represent the mean. The honest person is going to be the person that tells the truth when the truth is warranted, when the truth is appropriate. And of course, this virtue has two corresponding vices. There is, of course, the vice of being a liar, that is, an in, that is a vice of deficiency, insufficient truth-telling. And of course, then, uh, as we've just argued, there's also the vice of being a tattler, of being a loose tongue. And this is a vice of excess, of excessive truth-telling. So in all of these cases, um, all these cases would seem to vindicate Aristotle's view that moral virtue uh, always represents the mean between extremes. Um, that is not to say that there are not problematic examples. There, of course, are. Uh, I, I'm not going to go into them here, not because I'm trying to shill for Aristotle, but simply because um, uh, of, of limitations of time and space. But I will tell you that there are cases, there are, there are virtues that don't uh, succumb as, that, that don't fall as easily under this rubric uh, as the ones that we've listed. The ones that we've listed really, I think, work best for Aristotle. Now, let's just notice one thing about this, well, one important thing. The judgment that something represents a moderate state of character and a moderate choice of action is always a relative one. In the following sense, what counts as moderate depends on the circumstances. Right? In other words, the same action is not going to count as moderate in every circumstance. So let's just take the example of drinking. What counts as moderate drinking at someone's wedding party is not the same as what counts as moderate drinking the night before your final exams. Right? And so what counts as the virtue of temperance will depend on the circumstances. Right? Similarly, what counts as courageous or rash, what counts as an appropriate level of risk-taking, is going to differ, for example, in war and in peacetime. Right? If your country is under attack and you're at war and you have to you know, go off to fight, it may be courageous to run directly at a person pointing a gun and shooting at you. But in your ordinary life, to go seek out the local crime boss and get him to chase you down the street with a gun, that wouldn't be considered courageous. That would be considered stupid. And so um, it's important to understand that while there, Aristotle does offer a general account of moral virtue in the abstract, that is, 
the moral thing to do is always going to be the moderate thing to do between two immoderate extremes. What counts as moderate and immoderate depends on the circumstances. And this is why, although Aristotle offers a general account of moral virtue, he offers no general moral principles or rules. Right? Notice there are no rules in Aristotle. And Aristotle never says anything like, you should never do X, or you should never do Y. Because, of course, whether you should or shouldn't do X or Y is going to depend on the circumstances. I think that this is an aspect of morality that, that is absolutely crucial, that is too often forgotten, um, and, that, that, but, but, and, and is what makes Aristotle's ethics so plausible and applicable. I think too many people today think that morality is a matter of rigid principle. Never do this, always do that, right? And the problem, of course, is that the circumstances of life are many, varied, and heterogeneous, and open-ended. That is, there's an indefinite number of different possible circumstances one may run into. And to stand on rigid principle means that you're going to be doing the wrong thing an awful lot of the time. Right? To stand on the principle, never lie, no matter what, means you are often going to tell the truth when you shouldn't. And so, um, I think that this, this point about, about, about there being no general moral principles, there being no general moral rules, although there is a general account of ethics, that, that, right, the moral thing to do is always moderate relative to the immoderate choices. Um, what counts as moderate or immoderate surely is going to change from circumstance to circumstance. This is why... And if you, let's go back to our discussions uh, from last time. This is why the chief attribute of the morally virtuous person is practical wisdom. Right? Because the ability to determine and choose the appropriate cause of action requires good judgment. It's not something for which there can be a predetermined list of instructions. Right? Precis the, precisely the reason why you need practical wisdom, why you need good judgment in order to be moral, is because there isn't a predetermined list of rules available. Right? The list would have to be of indefinite length and of infinite variety, because circumstances are of indefinite number and of infinite variety. There's a fundamental difference between following instructions and exercising judgment. Right? When you bake a cake, you follow instructions. There's a list here. Do this, do that, do that, and the other. If you do all of those things, you'll have a cake. There are no such instructions that if you follow them, you're going to do the right thing. Because those instructions would have to anticipate every possible circumstance. Because what the right thing is depends on the circumstances. And the problem is that the number of possible circumstances in is, is, is of an indefinite length, and the types of possible circumstances are of infinite variety. If you look on pages 24 to 25, Aristotle says this quite clearly. He says, the idea of acting in accordance with right reason is a generally accepted one. Let's take it here for granted. But what right is reason is and how it is related to the other virtues? But this we must agree on before we begin. The whole account of what is to be done ought to be given roughly in an outline. Next page. The accounts we demand should be appropriate to their subject matter and the spheres of action of what, of, and what, of what is good for us, like those of health, have nothing fixed about them. Since the general account lacks precision, the account at the level of particulars is even less precise. For they do not come under any skill or set of rules. Agents must always look at what is appropriate in each case as it happens, as do doctors and navigators. Okay. So what he wants to say is, there is not going to be a preset list of rules such that if you follow them, you'll be a morally, morally uh, righteous person. Like there's a preset list of rules that if you follow them, you'll bake a good cake. Rather, moral virtue requires that in each case a person examine the situation and determine the right course of action. And that is a matter of sound judgment, not of uh, having memorized a list of moral rules. Let's talk for a minute about the acquisition of moral and civic virtue.
Because this, 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 this question of whether or not moral behavior is a form of rule following or whether it is a form of, uh, whether it is, is the result of exercising judgment, of soundness of judgment, goes directly to the question of how the moral virtues are acquired. If moral virtue is the result of rule following, right, if moral behavior is a form of rule following behavior, then ethics should be teachable. You should be able to hand a person a list of instructions, have them memorize it, send them out, and they should then be able to act morally. But, if moral virtue instead is a matter of soundness of judgment, then ethics cannot be taught in the sense of explicit instruction. That is, a teacher s issuing a set of true statements that the person learns and then is able to follow later. Aristotle argues that moral virtue is about the inculcation of sense. It's, it's more about inculcating sensitivity to circumstances rather than learning and following rules. Right? Think about what sound just judgment consists of. Sound judgment consists of the ability to look at a situation and figure out what the right thing, sense what the right thing to do is. Rule follow, the ability to follow rules requires no cultivation of judgment whatsoever, no cultivation of sensibility. It is, in a sense, can be done by, an idiot, by a moral idiot. Right. Oh, don't, shoot, don't shoot these people, do shoot those people, don't give these people money, do give those people money. Right. If, if that's what moral behavior consisted of, was, was following lists, it would require no judgment at all. It would require no reason. Right? If moral virtue was like, if moral virtue was like, <coughs> like cake making, we wouldn't need to be rational at all. Just be able to memorize instructions. But moral virtue, Aristotle thinks, is all about good habits and sound judgment. Indeed, the word ethics derives from the Greek ethos, which means habit. And this is why Aristotle compares the development of moral virtue to the acquisition of a skill, much more than like learning, being taught something explicitly. Um, uh, the, 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 an acquired skill, is, is the Greek for acquired skill is techne. Right? The person who has acquired an excellence in some skill or other, uh, typically the, the, the word is used to ascribe to, to master craftsmen, right? Right? A master craftsman possesses techne with respect to his particular craft. Um, Aristotle believes that ethos, ethics, is very much like techne. It is the result of, of, of apprenticeship, not explicit teaching. Right? Right? If you think about how someone acquires a skill and craft, how someone becomes a good cabinet maker, how someone becomes a good roofer, how somebody, right? It's done through practice under the guidance, under the supervision of a master craftsman. Right? You become a good roofer by building roofs under the, the, the supervision of a master roof builder. You become a good cabinet maker by making a lot of cabinets under the supervision of a master cabinet maker. You don't learn to become a good cabinet maker by sitting in a classroom and having somebody give you a set of instructions on how to make cabinets. And notice, when you're in an apprenticeship program, there's very little by way of explicit giving of instructions. There may be technical, there may, there may be factual knowledge that needs to be learned, certainly um, in crafts or skills that involve uh, technology, that involve electronics, one may have to learn circuitry, one may have to learn um, certain principles of physics, but the main process of acquiring the skill <coughs> uh, is, uh, is a process of apprenticeship of supervised experience, supervised practice. Right? There are no explicit lessons, there's just practice, observation, and correction. It is learning by doing, learning by experience. And Aristotle argues that moral and civic virtue is acquired in a very similar way. A young person is under the care of adults. The adults presumably are already morally virtuous, <coughs> and the process of raising a child is similar, in this sense, to the process of apprenticeship. He says this on page uh, 23, uh, pages 23 to 24. He talks about this. Actually, uh, yeah, pages 23 to 24. 
first sentence of page 23 says, virtue is of two kinds, virtue of the intellect and of character. Right? There's the, 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 the rational vir the virtues of intellect, practical reason and, and philosophic reason. And then there's the virtue of character, which is moral and civic virtue. He says, intellectual virtue owes its origin and development mainly to teaching, by which he means explicit instruction, for which reason its attainment requires experience and time. Virtue of character is a result of habituation, for which reason it has acquired its name through a small variation on ethos, which means habit. A little further down, second paragraph, he says, Virtues we acquire by first exercising them. The same is true with skills. Since what we need to learn before doing, we learn by doing. For example, we become builders by building and liar players by playing the liar. So too we become just by doing just actions, temperate by doing temperate actions, and courageous by doing courageous actions. So it is precisely because moral virtue, uh, what counts as morally virtuous depends on the circumstances, that moral virtue re it, it, that is predicated primarily upon soundness of, temp of judgment. Right? Right. A cultivated sensitivity to circumstance and the ability to make good judgments depending upon the circumstances. As a result, moral virtue is not something that can be taught by way of explicit lessons. One can teach or impart in a lesson a set of instructions. One cannot impart in a lesson a set of habits and soundness of judgment. That has to be cultivated in a quasi-apprenticeship mode. It has to be acquired by doing, by practice. Aristotle says, no one is born morally virtuous. We are born with the capacity to virtue. We're born with all, the con with all the equipment. We have the volitional soul. We have the rational soul. But all of these need, these need to be trained to work in tandem with one another. Right? We need to learn self-control. We need to acquire, self uh, acquire uh, uh, the soundness of judgment and good habits. And the, these are not things that can be explicitly taught in the manner of teaching that we think about, you know, in a classroom with a person talking and everybody sitting and listening. Let's talk for a little while about the contemplative life. You know, Aristotle spends nine books talking about the life of moral virtue and how it comprises the human good, right? He spends nine books in the Ethics talking about eudaimonia as the life of moral virtue, but then we get book 10, in which he changes gears entirely, and now is discussing eudaimonia as the life of contemplation. Indeed, to make things uh, spicy, he says that the contemplative life is the highest form of eudaimonia. Right? If there are two forms of the human good, the life of contemplation, Aristotle says, is the highest. It's higher than the life of moral virtue. And if you want to make this even spicier, he then goes on to say it also is an amoral life. And by amoral, let's be careful, amoral does not mean immoral. Immoral means bad. Amoral means neither good nor bad. So this is an awfully interesting position. Right? He says there are, th there are basically two forms of the human good. There's two forms of eudaimonia, the life of moral virtue, the life of contemplation. He said the life of contemplation is the higher of the two, and it is an amoral form of life. So the highest form of life for man is a life that is neither good nor evil. Uh, it is a life uh, purely spent in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the quest for knowledge. Why does he think this? And what, 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 does, what, does this, what does this position say more broadly about Aristotle's outlook on human nature and on human life? Aristotle believes that contemplation is the life of the gods. Right? The contemplative life is essentially the life of a god, but it is a life that some human beings in some circumstances can live. That is, in certain circumstances, certain people can live a life that is essentially the life of a god. This life is the life of contemplation. 
what's the explanation of this? I mean, we, in, 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 uh, for most of us, and I suspect that most of the people in the audience are, are, from, you know, are from the Judeo-Christian tradition, we don't think of God as a contemplator. Remember what contemplation is. Contemplation is the application of reason to the truth rather than to activity. Contemplation is a purely intellectual endeavor. Right? It is the pure, uh, the pure pursuit of the truth, the pure pursuit of knowledge. We don't think of gods as we don't think of, of God as as a sort of a, a divine scholar. Where does this view come from? Why does Aristotle think this, and what are the implications? Well. He comes to this through a very sort of straightforward, rational road. He says, look, a human being is a combination of a physical and a divine element. Right? We have physical bodies that are capable of physical activity. This is the physical side of our being, and it's one that we share with all the animals. But we also have reason, this non-physical uh, dimension of of the soul, some of which, some portion of which, which is directed towards the, the physical part, that's practical reason, but another part of which, right, the, the theoretical reason, which has no relation to, the, to embodiment or to activity at all. It operates on its own with respect to the truth. Now, moral virtue is an excellence that's comprised of the combination of these elements. Right, it's, it, moral virtue arises out of the combination of the divine element, reason, watching over and guiding the physical element, the body, and its activities. It is a prerequisite for moral virtue, then, that one be embodied. Right? You cannot have so, you cannot, a per, one cannot be disembodied and be morally virtuous, because moral virtue requires activity. Moral virtue arises as the intersection between reason and activity. A disembodied creature, by definition, cannot engage in activity and thus cannot be morally virtuous. Gods, of course, are neither embodied nor do they engage in physical activity. Aristotle has a hilarious passage here where he says, you know, gods don't, don't give loans. Gods don't make contracts. So how can they have the virtue of honesty? How can they have the virtue of, of justice? if they don't engage in the kind of acts that can be honest or that can be just. Gods don't uh, uh, engage in any activity at all because they are disembodied. Their souls consist entirely of reason. The soul of a god is, in, is nothing but a contem contemplative reason, is nothing but theoretical reason. Thus, the life of a god cannot be the moral life. Right? So for Aristotle, the gods are obviously amoral because they're not embodied. They, don't, they have neither a vegetative nor a volitional soul. Thus, there is no activity for their reason to attach to. Thus, the opportunity for moral virtue never arises. Gods are contemplators. And the life of contemplation is an amoral life. He says this on pages 197 to 198. Bottom of 197. We assume the gods to be supremely blessed, but what sorts of actions should we attribute to them? Just actions? Will it not be ridiculous if they make contracts, return deposits, and so on? Right? In order to be just, you have to engage in just activity. Well, what are just activities? Uh, keeping your promises, honoring your contracts, repaying loans. Do gods take out loans? Do gods make contracts? Of course not. They have no, so they have no opportunity to act justly. Thus, they can't have the virtue of justice. You see how he's thinking? Right? And this is a very logical progression. <coughs> it's utterly alien to our traditions because we tend to think of God, if anything, as the giver of moral law. Right? But in this, in this, in this, in this, in this uh, Greek tradition, Aristotle focuses on the fact that gods are disembodied and therefore literally cannot engage in the kinds of activities uh, from which moral virtue arises. He says, can they be courageous, enduring what is fearful and facing dangers because it is noble to do so, or generous? To whom will they give? <coughs> and it will be absurd if they have money or anything like it. What would their temperate acts consist in? Is such praise not cheap since they have no bad appetites? If we, were run, if we were to run through them all, anything to do with actions would appear petty and unworthy of gods. 
Nevertheless, everyone assumes that they are at least alive and therefore engage in activity. So if we remove from a living being the possibility of action, and furthermore the possibility of producing anything, what is left apart from contemplation? So the God's activity, which is superior in blessedness, will be contemplative. Okay. So the gods are contemplators. Contemplation being a completely disembodied form of, representing a disembodied form of activity, reason operating alone, has no connection to activity, and thus has no connection to moral virtue. And because the gods are higher than us, the life of the gods must be higher than the life of a mere human being. Thus, the life of contemplation must be a higher form of life than the life of moral virtue. Right? There's only one last point to add. While the life of contemplation is, for Aristotle, the highest form of life, it is also a dependent or parasitic form of life. Right? In order to be able to support a class of contemplators, a society must be prosperous, that is, it must be able to afford a group of people who engage in no productive activity but who merely think. Right? It must be, so it must be uh, prosperous, it must be politically stable, and it must have a far greater number of morally virtuous people. People who will appreciate the value of con having a class of contemplators and who will lead society in such a way so as to make room for such a class of people. The life of contemplation is a luxury, and so in that sense it's dispensable. You couldn't have civilization without morally virtuous people. You can have civilization without contemplators. However, though it is a luxury, it, is at, the, it at the same time represents the pinnacle of civilization. It represents the pinnacle of human achievement. So while you can have a civilization without contemplators, you cannot have a great civilization without contemplators. So in this sense, they are parasitic and, 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 and dispensable, but in another sense, they are essential. They're not essential to having civilization, they're essential to having great civilization. Let me just say one last thing. The way I read Aristotle, I would, I would say the follow, that the following accurately characterizes the, the, the view he's trying to get across here. The life of moral and civic virtue is the distinctively human form of flourishing because only human beings have that unique combination of divine and bodily element that working in tandem can produce this unique form of excellence. The life of contemplation is essentially the excellence of a god, but it is an excellence that some human beings can share in in some circumstances, and when we have those circumstances, it is very desirable that we have such people. But the reason why nine books of the ethics are devoted to the life of moral virtue and only one to the life of contemplation is because the life of moral virtue, more than anything else, constitutes human fulfillment in our capacity as human beings. And this is why the life of moral virtue is what receives uh, Aristotle's greatest attention in this book. Okay, we're uh, out of time. Um, I will not leave you with a next time. Um, uh, we're going to talk a little while. Well, we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, ancient Greek politics. Uh, so we're going to read a few selections, more selections from the ethics as well as from the politics. I won't give you anything to think about. Um, you have enough to think about right now. Uh, we'll talk about ancient Greek politics next time, and then we're going to start moving to modern ethics and modern political philosophy, and we'll spend a more time on modern political philosophy. So I will uh, see you all next time, and... Um, have a good day, afternoon, evening, whatever time it is you're watching this. Thank you.